At last weekend's Saudi Arabian Grand Prix, 18-year-old Brit Oli Behrman became the youngest Ferrari driver ever when he stood in for Carlos Sainz and he finished 7th during the race, having never competed in a competitive Formula 1 session until the day before. Fans and experts alike have been praising his amazing performance with so little experience, and rightly so, but that's not the first time we've seen someone replace another driver at such a short notice. Drivers would often chop and change in the first few decades of Formula 1, as teams often hired local drivers to each Grand Prix, or the drivers themselves entered privateer cars. When the 1970s came around, and F1 became more lucrative, smaller outfits would often allow pay drivers or otherwise different ones to change their lineups. For example, FWRC, or Frank Williams Racing Cars to give its full name, ran 10 drivers in 14 rounds during the 1975 season. By 1982, with the phasing out of privateer driver entries and most teams fielding two car teams, driver lineups became more concrete. You'd only usually see changes when either a driver was unfortunately injured or killed, or they had run out of money. Ferrari had a double dose of the former predicament during the 1982 season, where both the Canadian Gilles Villeneuve and the Frenchman Didier Peroni had to be replaced mid-season, as Villeneuve suffered fatal injuries from an accident in qualifying for the Belgian Grand Prix at Zolder, and Peroni had the same fate before him at Hockenheim, although he suffered career-ending injuries instead of deadly ones. Thus, their seats were filled by Patrick Tombe and Mario Andretti respectively. The Scarlet team has a knack for having to replace drivers. At a glance, since 1982, Stefan Johansson, Gianni Morbidelli, Nicola Lorini, Mika Salo, Luca Badoa, Giancarlo Fisichella, and the aforementioned Behrman have all made substitute appearances for Ferrari. The woeful attempts by Luca Badoa in the two races he did in 2009 are so well documented on YouTube to the point where it's just a cliche to cover it. Nicola Larini was also unlucky that while covering for John Lacy, he scored his only career podium at the fateful 1994 San Marino Grand Prix, and couldn't properly celebrate what was a great milestone. However, in this video, I'm not going to cover the doom and gloom negative stories of driver substitutions not going well. Instead, I'm going to talk about one of the lesser documented examples, one where the substitute was arguably better than the regular driver they were paired up against. Let me tell you the story of the most underrated stand-in performance in Formula 1 history. Juan Manuel Fangio is in the lead on the last lap of the German Grand Prix. Jim Clark drives the Formula 1 Lotus Sport to victory on the racetracks of the world. And look at that! Out that... And colossally, that's Mansell. That is Nigel Mansell. Alain Prost has taken the advantage. Senna is trying to go through on the inside, and it's happened immediately. This is amazing. Senna goes off at the first corner. And I've got to stop because I've got a lump in my throat. The 1999 season was an interesting one. The year prior, Mika Hakkinen had become the first drivers' champion with McLaren since Ayrton Senna and beat Michael Schumacher in a fight that went down to the wire. Going into 1999, Schumacher was motivated to win his third title, and after the fifth round in Spain, Michael led Mika by six points in the standings. However, after the German crashed out of the Wall of Champions from the lead in Canada and only finished fifth in Magny Corps, Hakkinen pulled out an eight point lead. Going into Silverstone, it was obvious Shuey had to win. However, after qualifying second to his Finnish rival, on lap one, the BAR of Jacques Villeneuve and the Williams of Alex Zanardi stalled on the grid. Race director Charlie Whiting accidentally hit the red flag button instead of the pit exit open button. However, Schumacher didn't see the red flags being shown, and so he was racing at full speed going towards Stowe Corner. His brakes failed, and he went straight into the barriers at full speed. He suffered a broken leg, which would see him be taken out of contention for the near future, and thus, Ferrari needed a replacement. The replacement the Scuderia selected was the 32-year-old Finn, Mika Salo. He had made his debut at the back end of 1994, driving for the crumbling Lotus team, then became a midfield stalwart as he competed for Tyrrell from 1995 to 1997 and Arrows in 1998, scoring 15 points collectively over those latter four years. He was left out of a full-time drive for 1999, however an injury for BAR's Ricardo Zonta gave him a chance, and with three races under his belt towards the start of the season, he got two top eight finishes in that awful backmarker car. Then after three races away, he got the call-up from Ferrari. As Schumacher was now out of a title fight, all the team's effort would be shifted onto the usual number two driver, the Northern Irish, Eddie Irvine. 
Irvine was a decent peddler during his time at Jordan, before joining Ferrari in 1996, although he had been labelled erratic by some, as he was punched in the face by Ayrton Senna after unlapping himself at the 1993 Japanese Grand Prix. Then he was banned for one race, for causing an accident at the following year's Brazilian Grand Prix, a penalty that was then extended to three races on appeal. Honestly, I think that crash which nearly took Martin Brundle's head off was a racing incident, but Irvine cooled down in the next few years as he matured. He'd scored 15 podiums before the 1999 season kicked off, and won the opening round in Australia, got a second in Monaco, third in Canada, and another second in Silverstone to add to that tally. Solo was brought in to help Irvine, as Irvine practically became what Schumacher had been for the past three seasons, so he could challenge for the title against Hakkinen. The first race Solo was Irvine's teammate for was the Austrian Grand Prix. On the Spielberg track, the Finn qualified 7th and only half a second behind his teammate in 3rd. However, in the race, Eddie won while Sala was a lap down in 9th. Admittedly, this result doesn't play into the idea that Sala was underrated, but he gets better from here. Sala actually out-qualified Irvine at the next round in Hockenheim by 2 tenths, but on race day after Mika Hakkinen crashed out while leading due to a tyre failure, Sala assumed the lead. However, he was given team orders to let Irvine through, and he did just that, and finished in second place, and Irvine gave him the winner's trophy in a magnanimous gesture after the race, because he believed Mika deserved the win. Despite outperforming his championship contending teammate as a number two driver, at Hungary, Salo struggled and qualified a lowly 18th, before finishing 12th and two laps down on race winner Hakkinen on race day. Irvine was third, and this meant his championship lead was reduced to only two points. The Finnish Ferrari man struggled again in Spa, and only finished 7th, but then in Monza, Salo again outqualified Irvine, this time by a single tenth, before finishing 3rd in the race, while Eddie was a lowly 6th. Then at the Nürburgring, in an attritional race, Salo was mired at the back, while Irvine also struggled as he failed to recover from an early strategy fumble in changing conditions. Then, for the penultimate event of the season at the new Sepang circuit, Michael Schumacher returned, and thus Salo was out of the drive. Shuey did his best to help Eddie in the final two races, as despite taking pole position by a full second in Malaysia, he sacrificed a win to hold up the McLarens and help his teammate as much as possible. Despite this, Mika won the title at the final race in Suzuka, having lost several race wins worth of points due to crashes and mechanical retirements. There are conspiracy theories abound in some circles that Ferrari sabotaged Irvine because they wanted Schumacher to be their first champion and not the Brits, but the Scuderia were desperate for a championship, so this seems unfounded. Just like Mika, Eddie also lost a handful of points through his own errors too. Moving away from the team's regular drivers, Solo's mid-season cameo showed some success. Admittedly, he only got two podiums in six races, but on the low downforce tracks in Monza and Hockenheim, he comfortably beat a title contender. He was inconsistent, but had a very high peak. After his 1999 stand-in performance, he drove for Sauber in 2000 and Toyota in 2002. He won the American Le Mans series in 2007, and won outright at the Bathurst 12 hour in 2014. His double podium effort in 1999 has gone under the radar, as his performances helped Ferrari claim the Constructors' Championship, even if they didn't get the drivers won. Just five years earlier, his compatriot Jerky Jarvaletto, aka JJ Leto, struggled as Schumacher's teammate in a similar situation. I genuinely believe this is one of the best standout performances in F1 history. With that being said, I think it's the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed me detailing the silky substitute performance from Mika Salo in 1999 for Ferrari. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe to see more content from me in the future. And as always, I'm going to give a big shout out to my only Patreon subscriber, Andy Lamberts. If you'd like to support me on a personal level and get access to videos early, consider becoming a Patreon subscriber for as little as $1 per month. With my shameless plugging over, I'm Nedzo and I'll see you all later. Bye!